Greetings and welcome to the Matt Asher Radio Show. I am your host, Matt Asher. Each week on the show, we explore the unknown knowns, the fringes of science and culture, the borderlands between truth and possibility. With me today is Brandy Scalace. Brandy is a historian of medicine, editor in chief of the journal Medical Humanities, and author of several books, including Mr. Humble and Dr. Butcher, A Monkey's Head the Pope's Neuroscientist and the Quest to Transplant the Soul, which will be the main subject of our conversation today. Dr. Skelache, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to have you on. Just a quick warning for listeners before we begin, I expect there will be some graphic <laughs> descriptions of medical experiments in our conversation. So depending on the strength of your stomach, you may or may not want to be eating spaghetti and meatballs during our discussion. <laughs> so your book is about the life and work of Dr. Robert White, an American neuroscientist and transplant surgeon. I found your book though, after hearing about Vladimir Demikov and his work with dogs, or maybe I should say on dogs. <laughs> so let's begin with his work. If you don't mind, set the stage for us. It's the Cold War era. The Russians are sending dogs up into space, but they're also using them as part of terrestrial experiments, right? It's, it's very interesting. It's a, it's a strange time to be alive. You know, prior to the 1950s, there were no organ transplants. So I want to start there because that's actually really critically important to the story. And so if you couldn't transplant organs, um, and that, that actually seemed almost like science fiction to people, then what could you do? Well, they did perform the first successful organ transplant in the United States, and it was the kidney transplant performed by Joseph Murray. Shortly after that, in 1958, a piece of footage is released from the Soviet Union, and it's black and white, and it's a bit grainy, but in this footage, a man walks onto a central stage, and he's leading what appears to be a dog, but this dog has been surgically altered, it has had the head of another dog transplanted to its body. And so it's a surgically altered, surgically created two-headed dog that they gave the name, uh, they, they named it Cerberus after the three-headed hound of hell. And the physiologist who performed this was Vladimir Dimikov. And this was sent out into the world with basically no explanation. So when it arrives in South Africa, in Europe, in the United States, it sends shockwaves through the transplant community because everyone has a lot of questions about this. First of all, how were they able to transplant a head, keep it alive? These two heads, this dog, they, they could look around together, they drank milk, they could move their ears and their heads, they watched you around the room, they panted, and it was both um, awe-inspiring and utterly terrifying because no one really knew what they were capable of behind the Iron Curtain. These two-headed dogs walk onto the screen and essentially into history, and suddenly they inspire a sense of competition, which I know our response might not be, look, a two-headed dog, I want to try that at home, but that is the response of some of the people who saw this footage, including uh, Christian Barnard, who later becomes the first person to do a successful heart transplant, he sees this and he says, if the Russians can do it, we can do it too. And strangely enough, this two-headed dog inaugurates a kind of inner space race with physicians on both sides of the Iron Curtain or researchers and scientists in a race to see if they can transplant organs, but more particularly, to see if they can transplant the head. Right, which is maybe in some sense the holy grail of transplants, and then perhaps in other another sense the most frightening of yeah. the the transplants. It certainly feels Frankenstein, doesn't it? Well, and and so you're in enters uh, Doctor White, um, who is aware of the mm -hmm. you know the Frankenstein story and its part in the culture, and doesn't necessarily shy away from that. But before we get to that, so how does he enter the picture? Well, it's, it's an interesting story. So much of this, um, you know, we, we think of medical marvels or medical miracles or these situations where the impossible has suddenly been made possible. So that first kidney transplant, which was performed on twins, because remember, this is still the age of uh, organ rejection, that your body's own immune system will frequently attack 
what is transplanted into it. But in this early moment, they've performed it on identical twins. The Herrick twins walk out of the hospital together. The patient who was on death's door goes on to live another eight years. And a medical student in the middle of all of this exciting time is Dr. Robert White. He's literally there at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston when this happens. He's also there in the surgeon's changing room when the footage is first released. And it's just the chatter of everyone like, oh my gosh, we've done, we've done kidneys, but they appear to be doing heads. What does that mean? And for Dr. White, his response was peculiar. Um, he, he talked about this at some length, and he said that on one hand, people were really frightened that the Russians had maybe figured out how to cheat death, that if you could transplant a head or keep a brain alive, that, that seed of personhood, would you be able to keep people alive indefinitely? So for instance, a, a constant Stalin for that matter, right? Could you, could you preserve people and give them new bodies? And that should be horrifying, but he saw it in a different way. He basically felt like it was the natural extension of organ transplant. Why transplant one organ at a time if you could give a head an entirely new body wrapped up in its package of you know, skin and flesh? I think that it's worth thinking about when, you know, as we're discussing this, getting yourself into the mindset as much as possible of someone back in that era mm -hmm. and the immense amount of unknown of what Russia was up to and vice versa, right? The the Cold War was a time of secrets on both ends of, of technology, both military and civilian being seen as key to victory against a, a very real threat. And I think both sides could legitimately see the other as a, a very real threat to their continued existence. So anything that's being done as far mm -hmm. as the edges of science or technology go has to be viewed from the lens of if we don't do it, they will. And if they do yes. it and they succeeded it at us, they will, you know, as, as Khrushchev may or may not have said and meant, bury us, right? right. Um, right. So, so all that's going on as were you know as the scientists in the US are pushing the limits of of what might be seriously ethically interesting let's just say <laughs> experiments right yes you know i do think it's hard for us to conceptualize this but you have to understand that um they were worried that if your science won your ideology won and this is a time period where i know there's lots of other nations besides the US and the USSR but just for a moment, you have to understand that there was a sense in which either democracy was going to triumph or Soviet communism was going to triumph. And there was a sense that those were the only options. So if their science was better than our science, it would mean that we literally could be buried. Look at what happened at the end of World War II. Science gives us the atom bomb, the atom bomb is dropped. It sends a clear message about who has the superiority uh, or the edge in science. And what's interesting is it was very, very shortly after that first bomb was dropped, the Soviet Union began experimenting and they demonstrated that they had this capability as well. And so you have this nuclear, this sense of, a, of, of you know, nuclear power, this potentially um, exponentially important atoms could, could just create this power that felt, that was like magical. So when you look back at Cold War understandings of things and you realize that shortly after World War II, the US government actually worried that the Soviets had perfected telekinesis and that they could control missiles with their minds and there's actual documents and reports about this, that sounds ludicrous to us now. But this is, this is the eve of all kinds of breakthroughs. If you can split an atom, what couldn't you do? So it's and, not, and I, I should note yeah. that we will now, within a short period of time, have the ability to do exactly that to control mm -hmm. rockets with our brain. So yes. you know, so not only you know, not only is it reasonable to at least consider the would have been reasonable to consider the possibility of that technology in the fifties, but mm -hmm. it is now fast on its way to becoming a reality. Exactly. Exactly. And we, we've even developed ways of uh, moving prosthetic limbs with just by thinking. And so they, there's by, you know, obviously hooking up electrodes and things. But the point is, no one was really sure where the limits were. You have on top of that, the, the Iron Curtain was um, was remarkable. Not only did it keep information from going out, it often kept information from coming in. And there was so many secrets in Soviet science that scientists 
operating sometimes even in the same building didn't know what each other were up to. So it's a very protected, everyone's playing it very close to the chest. No one wants uh, to leak this information. So what that means is that when that film footage is sent out about the two-headed dog, that's an intentional act that nothing got out of the Iron Curtain unless they wanted it to. So that means they were saying something. They were sending a message to the United States, to the world to say, look what we're capable of. And when you have people responding by, okay, we all need to get together and transplant some heads, that might seem like an overreaction, but it's not really an overreaction. It's absolutely the reaction that you might expect when someone's thrown a gauntlet like that at you in this incredibly fraught time period. Yeah, I think just to kind of maybe put it succinctly, the history of the world is more technologically advanced nations conquering lesser ones as far as technological advancement right. goes. <laughs> and that history didn't stop then and hasn't stopped now, right? Exactly. So mm -hmm. we so here comes Dr. White. It's this is the context. And he's there at the very beginnings of the story in terms of, of human transplants of organs in the US. Um, and then he goes on from there. Pick us up from, from that point of the story, if you don't mind. Sure. So he had, uh, Dr. White was a really interesting figure. Um, I've described him in some ways as uh, having an eidetic memory. And if you don't know what that means, uh, Nikola Tesla also had this. It's the ability to imagine things three-dimensionally in space and to the point of, of, of extreme detail. And so he, he was a, a unique figure. And that meant that he actually devised surgeries, devices, uh, new ways of performing surgeries, even new apparatus for surgeries in his mind. And he therefore didn't just want to be a brain surgeon. He did want to be a brain surgeon, but he also wanted to be a brain scientist. And oddly enough, uh, there weren't that many places where you could go and do both. Most places wanted you to commit one or the other. But as Robert White was finishing his PhD at the Mayo Clinic, he received an offer to come to Cleveland, Ohio, which happens to be where I live, um, to Cleveland, Ohio. And here he would be given the opportunity not just to perform brain surgeries. Um, we have University Hospital Cleveland Clinic and Metro Hospital here in town, but also the opportunity to run the brain research lab that he got to develop any way he wanted. And it was in this brain research lab that he conceived of the idea that, you know, the Russians sent a dog into space, right? So we sent monkeys into space. The Russians created their two-headed dog experiment and White decided he would perform these experiments on monkeys, on primates, our nearest evolutionary relative. And on one hand, that can be very upsetting uh, to people. And I'll, I'll warn you, there's some somewhat graphic images in the book. On the other hand, it makes perfect sense in a time period where we are sending tons of monkeys to space. And of course they don't, they typically don't survive. Um, right. I, you know, and yet we, we laud uh, NASA, but we, we tend to, to get a little bit more squeamy when we know that it's a uh, uh, medical procedures, but he decides to, to basically put in for funding to do what he calls a brain isolation experiment. And that's not, uh, we haven't leapt into head transplant just yet, but he's on his way. And what he really wants to do is to find out if you can take the brain out of a living creature and keep the brain alive outside of its body. And I, I think most of us can imagine a brain in space, maybe cartoony sort of pink blob or something. Um, and it seems very clinical and even cartoonish. But to get a brain out while it's alive, especially if we think of this, of our head and our brain as being our personalities, our, our, our selfhood, our animating principle, then the brain itself is the life. So, he wants to do an experiment that proves that the brain can outlive its own body and still send out brain signals. And that's the first thing that he attempts when he gets to uh, Cleveland, Ohio's brain research lab. So before we get into the details of that, I think it's worth a, a description of the, the patients, if you want to call it that, the sacrificial subjects, yes. uh, whichever way you want to view it. Uh, undergoing these experiments. These people think monkeys, there are a variety of different monkeys out there. What are the specific monkeys that he's working with and why pick those particular ones? Um, so it turns out that mostly what he experimented on were rhesus macaques. And actually macaques were used a lot for NASA as well, even though 
uh, most of our more famous footage is of the chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are very expensive and they're often quite delicate creatures as well in, in many ways. Macaques are hardy. They are also uh, very, very strong and very, they're territorial, they're, they can be aggressive. They are monkeys to whom many people will not necessarily become attached in the lab. Is, so I'm not- Why, why is that? <laughs> they were not very friendly. Um, remember they were also doing experiments on dogs, but often it's, it's harder to do an experiment on an animal that you might also think of as a pet. Um, Dr. White did do experiments on dogs and cats, and in fact, um, brought a cat that he had performed a hemispherectomy or, or removed half the brain um, home, and it became their family pet. It could only walk sideways, so they named it Sidewinder. But it, traditionally speaking, most people are not very familiar with monkeys and macaques being sort of aggressive, and I, I think there are lots of reasons that you might feel less attached to them that doesn't end up making this any easier. And I have to say, um, I did my best in the text to take the edge off a little bit, but I actually had to watch the, the videos of these surgeries and it can be extremely unsettling because despite the fact that they're much smaller than a human being, there's many things about a macaque monkey that will remind you of a small child. They have you know, four fingers and a thumb, just like we do. They, they play, they interact, and they have facial expressions. So the, these were the monkeys that were being used in these experiments, they were also much cheaper than chimpanzees. And because of their hardiness, they were easier to keep alive. So, and going to the, I guess, the similarities with people, one of the things they had to do in order to do tests was train some of them. So these weren't just taken, plucked right from the jungle right. and then kind of uh, experimented on. They invested their own time and energy into bringing these monkeys up to a level where they were. And I actually, I hesitate to use these comparisons because I don't think that reducing intelligence to a scalar is a good idea, but you say in the book, maybe a two or three year old in terms of intelligence, at least to give people in a, a general idea. But again, right. I, I, I don't really like the, you know, the single yeah. point uh, estimate of intelligence as opposed to a, a broader one, but they're not, they're not snails, right? No, no. And, and they're not mice. And, you know, this is a, um, granted, I, I find it somewhat difficult to watch experiments on mice as well. I think it's difficult to watch experiments on any animal, even when you know it's to potentially save human beings later. Uh, I actually did um, interview and speak somewhat at length with Ingrid Newkirk, founder of PETA, for this book, just to get her take That's on these things. people for the ethical treatment of animals. Right. And, uh, you know, one of the things she pointed out is that if you think any animal has, uh, you know, cognizance, value, emotions, then you should think every animal does. And, and it's a good point. So, you know, despite the fact that people tended to get more upset about experiments on dogs than monkeys, um, and, and perhaps more upset about monkeys than they do mice, these are all living creatures that are about to be subjected to some uh, pretty grisly surgeries. Now, so not all of them would be experimented on that would lead to their deaths, but a number of them would be experimented on knowing that they probably would not survive the procedure. And so that uh, he, he had to apply for funding and IRB, uh, International Review Board, um, he had to do all the things that were necessary to prove that he was going to humanely treat these animals in the lab. But again, this is 1960s, uh, 1970s, and you know, the laws were very different then. That's actually prior to uh, a lot of the animal rights movements that that went on. So, so just preparing uh, well, the reader. Well, uh, yeah, I want to get more into the ethics uh, and, and your own views on that. But we got to take a break here, and maybe when we get back, we will actually get to the monkey heads floating in space <laughs> of the lab. I am talking with Brandy Scalace, the author of a book about the attempt to transplant a human head. And where we left things off, we had some monkeys in the lab and they were about to lose their heads. Or their bodies, as, it, as the case may be. <laughs> um, the first experiment of brain isolation occurred, uh, it was actually in the, in the 60s, and it was the late 60s. Dr. White had basically realized that the best way to keep a monkey's brain flushed with all the fluids and oxygen that it needed was to provide it with sort of a, a life support system. 
And what I mean by that is the brain's a very greedy organ and it just, it requires tons of oxygen. If you're deprived from oxygen in your brain for even a very short period of time, the brain cells begin to die. You'll experience brain damage and ultimately death. He originally had something planned that was a bit like a lemonade machine circulator, but he realized that there is something that works even better than a life support system. And that is another body. So he ended up pairing small macaque monkeys with much larger ones. He used the larger ones as a blood supply for the smaller monkey's head. So essentially you'd have two monkeys, the first one sitting in a chair, and he would have uh, tubes from his arteries feeding into the veins and arteries of the smaller macaque monkey. And then they would go about the slow, steady work of unplumbing the head of the macaque from its original body and instead flushing it with the blood of the other monkey. So visually, similar... just so we can picture this, because it's, it's mm -hmm. quite the sight, you have a, a, a brain that ends up floating uh, from cables and stands and other things that yes. is being bathed in the blood of the other monkey that is pumping through the through its body, uh, art artificially being pumped through its body, right? Because it no the the brain, the floating brain, is not controlling the body of right. the right. you know of the the donor body, right? No, no, the donor body is really almost the reverse. So the donor monkey, who is a he's uh, he's he's been put under an anesthesia, but he's still in there, he's still awake and alive and all that, um, or not awake actually, but alive, and he's sitting bolt upright in a chair that was specially made for him. And from his femoral artery, he is feeding blood from his own heartbeats into the, the sort of disembodied head of the other monkey. It's actually being suspended uh, on a little, um, almost like a small crane uh, apparatus. Now this head, now it has the blood, it has the suffused blood coming from the other monkey. The head is obviously also anesthetized, is not awake. Now they wanna get the brain out of there and they have to carve it out of its, uh, its skull, its, its face. This is very, very upsetting work to, to watch. It's much easier once you just have the brain. And I, I think that's interesting. Most of us are not that upset by an individual organ, but the idea of getting one out is, is a extremely difficult to kind of to, to, to envision. Um, so I, I used to tell people giving my talks, I was like, if it helps you to imagine cartoon monkeys in your brain, please do that. But it, it is a, it is upsetting. It's ethically uh, challenging. So he ultimately ends up with this little bulb of brain and it's suspended on a device that almost kind of looks like a, um, I compare it to a sort of lava lamp without the glass shield and it's being pumped full of blood, full of fluid. It's naked, denuded of flesh by itself. They have it hooked up to electrodes and these electrodes feed to an EEG machine or an electric insectograph machine, sorry. Um, would, would you see it with the little, you know, if you're alive and awake, you've got the nice peaks and valleys. Here's this brain, nobody. And it's producing the peaks and valleys on the graph paper. It's still thinking. So I want to pause there for a moment because I think this is interesting and, and important too. You, you mentioned that it's more disturbing for us if we see basically a decapitated head, an actual recognizable part of the body than to see the bare brain there, which mm -hmm. I, I assume our brains just automatically think of as something that's dead, right? Mm -hmm. It's like from a cadaver, but when it's a, right. a head that might actually blink, then that seems much more horrific. But at the same time, from perhaps from the perspective we don't know of what's going on inside that brain, if you still have a head, then you still have some kind of sensory input coming right. in and you still have some kind of control over your organism. But the idea of being a head floating in space, while some might think of it as being a peaceful thing, it's hard for me to think of it as anything but perhaps just about as horrible as you could imagine. We know mm -hmm. that 
one of the things that's extremely hard on human beings is to be in some kind of an isolation chamber where mm -hmm. they don't have the regular level of stimulus coming in. Right. You have people go who go into very, very quiet, dark spaces and begin to hallucinate within, you know, within an hour or to kind of lose their marbles. Um, right. So to imagine what it would be like to have not just you're, you know, not just be in a very quiet place or floating in a, one of those saline pools where they do the, you know, those, those pools, but to actually have zero stimulus, we don't really know, but you don't have any information whatsoever coming from a corporal form. And I, I don't even know where to go with what that right. would be like, but it, it doesn't seem pleasant. No, um, I mean, it, there's a, a full sensory deprivation that, that happens here because, and, and I will say the graph paper, there was three things they were measuring. One of them, uh, one of the, the little spikes that you see on those graph papers is measuring sensory input and there isn't any. So it's the one place where it was basically flatlined because nothing's, nothing's happening. But the other areas of the brain, um, the other sort of processes going on were still apparently ongoing inside that naked bulb of brain. So and you could have pain and nothing to do to solve it or even It's hard nothing. to say. It's very hard mm -hmm. to say and because obviously we can't ask the, the brain. So for white, it proved one very specific thing. It proved that life was the brain. And, and this, this is important to him because there's a lot of discussion about brain death going on at the same time. Remember I was talking about organ transplants. It's one thing to have your kidney removed because you can live on your other kidney. But when we get to Christian Barnard doing heart transplants, obviously if you're taking that heart out of somebody, you want the heart to still be beating, but you don't want that person to still be alive because they can't live without the heart. So a whole discussion erupts about when are you dead enough to take an organ? When are you brain dead? Is that real death? Is it the same thing as death? So their question was, when is the brain dead? When are you dead enough? Dr. White decided to ask the question in reverse. If a flatline EEG signal meant you were brain dead, then does an EEG signal, even though you don't have a body, mean you're alive? So for him, it was almost a way of proving the point that brain equals life. And for Dr. White, who was deeply Catholic, it also meant that your soul was still alive. And it was kind of a, a roundabout way of saying that the soul also could outlive its body. So the, his, his belief was that the soul resided in the brain mm -hmm. in, in effect, that you could lose any parts of your body. And as long as your brain was still functioning, your soul was still there in that gray matter. And I think to some extent, I think we all take that for granted today, but it's worth noting that that was not always the case. People didn't, people thought that, you know, everything was in the heart, right? That right. that or was the, the, the seat of, or the stomach, which I think there's actually a, a case to be made for that given yes. the amount of, of neurons in there. And I mm -hmm. often think that my stomach is competing with my upper brain <laughs> for uh, my attention to say nothing of any Quite. other parts that one might have that might be uh, competing for attention. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it is just worth noting that our own framework of everything being brain centric is a modern one and it wasn't it always is. so actually one of the fun stories that kind of shows this is there was a, a Mexican general I forget his name but he lost his his leg in the war and then he gave it a burial with full honors which to our modern ears seems absolutely absurd but it if it was done it probably wasn't that absurd to the culture then so the right. idea that that you would, that if you lost a limb, that you lost a part of yourself that was more than just dead flesh, that was a common view. And this is, the, at, even at the time of, of Dr. White, that view hasn't completely gone away. He's wrestling with it, right? That's right. I, and, and, and of course, it's still complicated. Um, Dr. White was definitely a sort of Cartesian dualist in the sense that he believed you were your brain, you, you were up here in your head and that no matter what else happened, you could get a whole new body and he still felt like you would be you. I'm not sure that we still, um, I, I don't know that that's, I think the jury's out on that because of course we do, we have neurons in our stomachs, we have neurons in other parts of our body, we have hormones that are affecting our personalities and all sorts of things. 
Uh, I think the LGBT movement has proven to us how important your body is to your sense of self and identity. So, um, so he might not have been right about it, but for Dr. White, he really felt, no, this is an intact monkey. The monkey's alive because its brain is still alive. And to him, this was a relatively unproblematic thing. He felt that he had proved it. But other people in the medical community did not agree. And so many of his colleagues were fascinated by having an isolated brain. It meant that they could study certain kinds of things like how a brain metabolizes without the body around it or how it might interact with uh, neurodrugs without the sort of mediation of the body. But they didn't necessarily buy his argument that the brain was really alive. And they even suggested that the little ticks on the graph paper didn't constitute real thought and that the monkey wasn't still in there, so to speak. Um, and, and that ends up being a real blow for Dr. White. He felt very upset. He thought that he had, he had sort of made the case. And because he hadn't, he had to go further. And that actually brings us right back around to those two-headed dogs. Right, great. So, so how, do those, how does that end up happening? How do we get a, a two-headed dog? So I have to say, I, I ended up having to travel to Moscow myself uh, for researching this book. I was, I, like you, I was incredibly fascinated by the story of Vladimir Demikov. First of all, how do you make a two-headed animal that doesn't immediately just die? How, how do you get a head attached to another body? How does that even work? Uh, certainly without brain damage, you know. So I wanted to learn more about him and it's not easy to find information about Vladimir Denikov. It turns out that when he performed his surgeries at that time, he wasn't necessarily on great terms with a lot of the people uh, in the government and higher up. And he didn't, he didn't play well sometimes with the sort of Soviet machinations of the way science was supposed to be done there. He ended up falling on rather hard times. So discovering where these surgeries and, and experiments took place took some doing. I had been told that he was working in a hospital. I was also told he was working in a church. And later I was told he was working in a stable. And I thought, well, these things can't all be true. But it turns out they can. I found it. I, I actually found this. It, it was part of a hospital. It was an old church. And apparently Napoleon used to stable his horses there when he tried to take over uh, Moscow and parts of Russia. Not a it's good idea for not those a good who idea, want a no. spoiler alert. Yeah, it didn't, didn't actually go so well for him or for anyone else who's tried it, actually. But um, it's a very small space. You know, I went inside. It's, it's little. It's thick walled. It's not particularly, you know, at the time it had rudimentary electricity and things like that. And yet, without any of the techniques we might normally associate with, you know, experimentation in labs and building his own materials, his own apparatus, even his own surgical tools, which I saw while I was there, he manages to take the head off of one small dog and put it on the body of a much larger dog. And he does this essentially by severing uh, the body almost at its midsection. So the, the, the upper body has no heart. Uh, it is being entirely, the blood is happening. It's being pumped by the larger dog. So he's attached this dog, not to the side. We might normally think of two heads sitting next to each other, but he actually attaches it at the back of the first dog's head. So it's a small dog's head attached at the back of a large dog's head. And that's because it's closer to the main arteries and things closer to the heart. He basically achieves this surgery simply by being very, very fast. He's so fast that the brain doesn't lose any oxygen or blood and therefore it continues to live on, which I found utterly fascinating. It meant he had to have been uh, such an amazing surgeon if he had actually been operating with, uh, you know, with proper support and tools and techniques. But so you have White. White, he has this kind of dressing down by his colleagues saying, no, we don't believe that this isolated brain is still alive. And he thinks back to that grainy video from 1958. And he decides he needs to find and talk to Vladimir Demikov about how he achieved his surgeries because he feels like that might be the way forward. So and that he, launches, you know, that, that <laughs> launches him and, and he's off to Russia. We'll have to 
pick this up in a moment here. Just want to note that one of the wonderful things about the book is the picture that you give of Soviet era Russia, and I think a a, a very interesting society and an, an awful society in many, many ways. I think you do a, a really good job of portraying what it would have been like to be a scientist there and to try to be doing your own work, not, um, not interfered with by the apparatus and that was the Soviet apparatus and the, mm -hmm. the challenges there. I'm here with Brandy Skilliche, and we are talking about Dr. White, a kind of mad scientist, if you want to put it that way, a uh, scientist certainly who made a lot of people mad. Uh, but where we left off was actually in Russia, and Dr. White was going to visit a surgeon there who had performed a head transplant. Yes. So Dr. Vladimir, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. White wanted to find Vladimir Demikov, who was a physiologist. And the interesting thing is he was invited to Russia. They, they actually welcomed him with open arms, Dr. White. And he arrives and uh, he's immediately sort of whisked away. He definitely, it becomes very apparent to him that he has handlers and that there's some things he's allowed to see and some things that he's not allowed to see. I actually titled the chapter, uh, Science Behind, or Brains Behind the Iron Curtain, Vodka and, and Science Vodka and Pretty Girls, because um, they, he was sort of plied with distractions, you might say, while he was there. And while uh, he'd go to these dinners and these various things, and they were showing him their, their most amazing technologies, and White realized that they were so far behind the United States. Dr. White had actually, at that point, already perfected a technique called perfusion, which is therapeutic hypothermia. That's what he used to cool brains down so they weren't so greedy for oxygen. It meant you could more leisurely perform these surgeries. They didn't have anything like that. One of the people that he was with showed him their very exciting new technology, which was an incredibly old, outdated computer. And of course, that was, you know, we, we had well moved beyond those kinds of things. And White suddenly realized that they weren't the boogeyman, that behind the Iron Curtain, there was not some dangerous, you know, uh, scientific apparatus that was going to blow away the United States. It was scientists and people who often were quite well-meaning, who had been hamstrung by bad finances, by difficulties in their, uh, in the political situation. And in fact, no one would tell him where Vladimir Demikov actually was. So it took him quite some time, including sort of slipping away from his handlers and investigating uh, Moscow on his own before he finally finds him. And it turns out that Temikov had, he lived in a two room apartment with his wife, his daughter, and several of the dogs that he experimented on. And at one point he was so, um, he'd been so fraught, so upset by the way he'd been treated that he even contemplated suicide. So, it was heartbreaking for White to see that this physiologist had been brought so low uh, because partly just because he wasn't good at dealing with the political apparatus around him. But he allows Demikov to show him around his rudimentary lab. And the one thing that White does take away from this is that if you can't convince people that a naked brain is still alive based only on EEG, you could convince them that a head was still alive in much the same way that the second head of the dog appeared to still be alive and still moving around and it showed that the brain was still operational. So White returns to the United States deciding now is the time to actually transplant a monkey's head onto the body of another monkey. And so a full transplant, not a two-headed monkey, but literally monkey A's head on monkey B's body and then allow it to wake up so as to prove that consciousness resided in the brain. And so this becomes a major focus of the rest of his life, first in terms of the monkeys and then in terms of human beings. Uh, the, you know, and then he, he also is very much, there are ethical concerns swirling about all of this work, but the visuals anyway of the, of the two-headed creature, of the mutant, uh, of the chimera, I don't know, something yeah. like that, of sorts, right? Mm -hmm. um, are are startling and um, and so it, it, the doctor is trying to get this done, but as he as he gets closer and closer to 
trying to bring this to fruition on an actual human being, the, the, the headwind, so to speak, begins to increase on him. And so what, what happens when he begins his process of trying to get this done first on you know, a monkey and then on a human being? So the first head transplant, and I, I, I do want to just clarify, um, White called it a head transplant to begin with when he worked on monkeys. He would later refer to it as a body transplant. So I get asked this a lot, but there's a rhetorical reason that he makes that change, and I'll, I'll, I'll explore that in just a second. But essentially, 1970, he, he's funded, and you know this is a national grants, and they're like, yes, this is seems like a good idea. So you have to understand that there wasn't this outcry. It wasn't as though a whole lot of other people you know, in, in his profession or in the public stood up and said, this is horrifying, you shouldn't do this. And you might think there would be, but there wasn't, not then. So that first monkey head transplant was considered a triumph of science. And what he, he does in fact, transplant one monkey's head onto the, another monkey's body using much the same uh, technique as the brain isolation experiment, except then leaving the brain inside the head and transplanting it over onto another macaque. And it wakes up. And that is probably the most exciting, strange, horrifying, disgusting. I mean, you know, it's, it's this monkey sewn onto another monkey's body and it opens its eyes. It wakes up, it comes out of anesthesia. It tries to bite Dr. White, it, but it's clearly alive. It's following people around the room. It's attempting to vocalize. Of course, it's paralyzed. They've severed the spinal cord in this process. So it can't control the body that it's attached to. Uh, the autonomic system, the heart uh, beating on the autonomic system is supporting the, the monkey's brain. But otherwise, it has no it has no feeling. It has nothing below its neck. Um, it does have the sensory input of its eyes, its ears, uh, its face. They they feed it. They give it water. But essentially, this is this is a, a just a head on a life support system. And White feels that it's a great triumph. And he says, after the successful surgery, have I come to the place where I can now transplant the human soul? Because for White, this has always been about translating this experiment into human medicine, uh, which almost all of his experiments did translate into human medicine, including perfusion. Um, in fact, we use it all the time now in brain surgeries, but also for heart attack victims. Uh, my father had open heart surgery just this year, and they use that cooling technique so that you don't suffer brain damage during stopped heart procedures. So it's very, very important and terrifying um, to think that his idea was, who can we save? with a head slash body transplant. And he loved to talk about how this would be the kind of surgery you'd want for someone like Stephen Hawking, uh, who he felt was you know, already paralyzed and essentially a brain uh, on life support system in the best of senses. And he felt that shouldn't we want to preserve Stephen Hawking's life? Shouldn't we wanna give him a new body and help him to live on? And so that's how he conceptualized the way that this would help human beings. Um, I, I will say that Stephen Hawking never signed on to that idea. Uh, yeah, you note in the book, and I, I think this is probably the case, that part of his image and his success, probably even in the public sphere, this is Stephen Hawking, is as a result of him being in the wheelchair. It's it's his brand. Right. Well, he, he, he liked to say that um, he didn't have to be bothered with bodies. Um, it, he said it more eloquently than that, but uh, Stephen Hawking was not interested in, in getting a body transplant. But that doesn't mean no one was. Um, what most people don't understand or appreciate is that Dr. White didn't go seeking a human patient volunteer. A human patient volunteer sought out Dr. White. Uh, his name was Craig Vitovitz. He was a quadriplegic and it's, uh, this tetraplegia was caused by a diving accident when he was quite young. And you know he had been he felt that he'd been a bit written off by medicine even early on. There wasn't a lot of uh, of training or therapy, so he invented his own. He built himself uh, a writing apparatus. He built himself a new wheelchair. He became an inventor. He started his own company. He had children. He was married. He traveled extensively. He had a full life, but he was quite young still, and his organs were beginning to fail, which does happen sometimes with paralysis patients. He wanted a kidney transplant but he wasn't considered a good candidate because he was paralyzed. And yet he wasn't ready for this to be the end of his life. So after hearing about Dr. White, he contacts him and says, I would be willing to be your first patient for a human body slash head transplant. 
and that uh, is taking place in the in the early 1990s. So a, a significant part of the book then towards the end uh, involves Dr. White's attempts to pull this off, but there are a number of different obstacles here. Some of them uh, become easier with time. One of them is what's the point of putting a, a new head on if you can't control your body mm -hmm. and technical advances come along that make it easier for people to have some level of control over their body uh, just through brain implants. Uh, and, and we have that now. Uh, but then there are other obstacles that don't go away in the form of kind of the, the resistance on the ethical front. Mm -hmm. And then also just a, a matter of funding. This is to transplant a, a body ahead, however way you would want to put it. It, it wouldn't be an, a, a cheap or no, simple I mean, upwards, thing to upwards do. Upwards of $7 million at least. So so what what ends up happening as he tries to, to get this done for this particular patient? Well, I, I think one of the important things to notice about this story is um, the entire history is kind of interestingly cross-sectional with American history. Uh, and, and world history, which is, yes, this is the history and part of how we've become technologically adept at doing transplant surgeries, but this is also a period of time that saw the, uh, the human rights, uh, civil rights movement, the animal rights movement, um, increasing sense of, of, you know, what do we really want to be spending our, our money and time on? The fall of the Soviet Union, which took away one of those competing sort of driving forces uh, in edgy, you know, fringe science. So what you end up with is a time period that is wildly different from the, from the time from the 1960s and 1970s. So maybe it's only 20, 25 years uh, you know, apart, but that's a big, important 25 years. And White himself hadn't changed as much as the time around him had changed, as the people and the, the ideas in society had changed. He had already stirred the ire of uh, animal rights activists even early on but now the animal rights activists kind of have the public at their back not most people are not that interested in seeing you know these kinds of experiments that don't especially ones that don't seem to have a very direct application uh, to helping human beings so in the end um, the world was not as willing to push those kinds of boundaries and that meant the world wasn't as willing to fund it either so in the end dr white does not perform the surgery on Craig Vitovitz, even though he very much wanted to. So we're just about out of time on the radio show here. For the folks who are listening on Keys Talk FM, please know that all of the episodes are wrapped up into a podcast and posted to mattasher.com. So you can go there and uh, check out the full conversation. There's a lot more I'd like to get to. Is it okay if we stick around and talk some more just for the podcast audience? Oh, absolutely. There's a, right. lot, there's a lot to do. <laughs> there, there's a lot more, especially on the, the ethical front. But just as we wrap up here, a quick question. I'm sure the audience would like to know if a head transplant has ever, to your knowledge, been done on a human being at this point. To my knowledge, no. And uh, that doesn't mean that they haven't thought about it. Um, in fact, there's a surgeon named Sergio Canavero who very much wanted to do one in 2017. And even also himself had a willing volunteer patient However, the volunteer patient fell in love and got married uh, and decided that he didn't want to uh, subject himself to a potentially life-ending surgery, even though he himself, like Craig Vitovitz, was also has a body that is ultimately going to fail him. So, yeah, so no, we'll, it hasn't we'll, we'll have to, <laughs> unfortunately, we'll have to pick that up uh, here on the podcast, everybody. Thanks for listening on uh, Keys Talk FM, and I'll, I'll be with you again next week. Thank you. So you're the number one result for head transplant uh, searching. Uh, these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is, is that a, an, an honor, a dubious honor? How, how would you put that? Um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. I, I, if you put in, if you type in uh, head transplant or weird science or uh, death, there, there's, there's a lot of ways to find me on Google. Um, but uh, I, I, I tend to, to trouble these, these, sort of murky boundaries of science and ethics all the time. Uh, head transplant just being my latest foray. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things I really liked about your book is that you 
it seems like you do a pretty good job of trying to get at both sides or multiple sides of the issue. Right. And so reading through, it wasn't clear to me where you stood in terms of kind of your final judgment on all this. So I wanted to ask you now if you're, you know, if, if you're willing to wade in with a, a specific point of view about the ethics of everything that was going on in the book. You know, it's so appropriate, but basically I'm of two minds about it. <laughs> um, it I, I, I found I couldn't really put my foot down on either side either. Uh, to begin with, I, I will let you know that I, I sort of went on a journey. When I started off and I'm reading about these animal experiments and I'm an animal lover. Now, I'm also very in favor of science. I'm not anti-experiment or anti-science, but it was it was hard. It was hard to read this. And I kept thinking, well, but if you're creating only a paralyzed uh, monkey on the other side of this, uh, and the monkey did live for, for nine days after the surgery, um, I thought, well, what's the point, really? But then I read and researched and got to know the Craig Vitovitz story. And Craig Vitovitz himself had since passed away, but his son was still alive. I've, I've gotten to know him pretty well and talked to him quite extensively. And what I realized is I was saying, what's a life if you are paralyzed? And that's incredibly ableist when you when you realize suddenly, oh my goodness, I hadn't really considered the fact that there are people who have disabilities who are paralyzed. They live completely full, normal, active lives. They, they aren't lesser for any reason. So when Craig Vitovitz says, I don't see why I should be denied uh, a, a full body transplant, I'm willing to take the risk because I don't want to die. And my mind, my, my head is good. I, I wanna keep going on. I wanna see my kids graduate and get married. Suddenly I had a very different you know, sort of sense of, of whether or not this was ethical and right to do. So I, I found myself uh, vacillating, uh, you know, between these two things. Is this an ethical right surgery to do? If it's saving and extending people's lives, maybe it is. Um, it, it's, a, it's a tough one. It, it is really tough. And the dynamic in the book, you present the, the battles, the intellectual battles um, that uh, Dr. White has with the mm -hmm. representatives of, of PETA and so forth. I it feel, so my own take is this, and it, it starts at a more abstract level in that I think we have a really hard time culturally dealing with the idea of marginality and of mm -hmm. gradation. And maybe this is something to do with the particular moment in, maybe it's just hard for human beings overall. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of these arguments, we don't, we don't deal with that concept. So to take maybe the most extreme and controversial uh, uh, sort of subject, abortion, you mm -hmm. have folks in the pro-abortion rights camp who really can't distinguish a, a, a nine-month-old viable fetus from a two-day-old zygote. Right. And I, that's absolutely absurd. But, yeah. but then, of course, on the other side, you have uh, folks who, you know, who oppose the day after a pill because they can't tell the difference between a two-day-old zygote and, a, you know, a, a full-term fetus that could be delivered at any moment. And, you know, and they oppose a, a d and &E at nine months with the same fervor that they oppose, you know, the day after pill, right? Right, right? And what's missing in those debates is any understanding of, you know, that every day, every moment you are becoming marginally more human, your consciousness is increasing. And a, a lot of the, throughout a lot of the book, I, I spent thinking about that idea of consciousness and the way in which we understand it and even death as a binary, but really the only way I think to try to make headway on the ethical frontier mm -hmm. and be aligned with the reality of our world is to understand that you mentioned it in the book that death is a process, right? right? That And that consciousness is a process too. And that you can't just put any of these, um, any of these activities mm -hmm. into, you know, in, into binary categories no, and then no. ignore everything in the middle. Well, and, and this is, uh, so it's funny, my, my uh, the sort of tagline I use for myself is adventure at the intersections. And so intersectionality and liminality are places I feel quite at home in, but you're right, most people don't. Um, I, I know we're talking about my book, but I feel almost like I need to plug a, another book, which was published right around the same time, but Carl Zimmer, he wrote uh, Life's Edge. And um, I actually run a book club called the Peculiar Book Club, 
where Carl Zimmer will be joining uh, me. And basically, uh, the, the readers get to ask discussion questions of the book of the author in these live stream events. And this will be July 22nd. But um, Carl Zimmer's book, Ed, uh, Life's Edge, talks about the fact that if you can take skin cells and abstract from them stem cells and then grow organoids, which are tiny little or mini organs. So they were growing mini human tissue brain cells and the brain cells divide. Uh, and then some of them can send out rudimentary signals. So there's a real interesting crossover between my book and this one uh, and, and Carl's book. Is that brain alive and is it human? Does it deserve human rights? And then he asks, and if that's true, does that mean all of your human skin cells are technically afforded the same human rights as say, uh, you know, uh, anti-abortion people want to afford the cells of, uh, you know, a two-day-old zygote. So it, it's mm -hmm. a fascinating point that he makes that we don't actually know where the edges of life are. Uh, we, we really don't. And this is true. And my book talks about the edges of death. Um, believe it or not, while there's a legal definition of brain death, there's still no medical definition of brain death. There's no medical definition that says we know dead and we know alive but there's no medical definition of, of how you get from one to the other and, and exactly what those gradations are, so much so that you can actually be declared alive in one country and dead in another because our laws are different. So, so you know, we really don't understand these edges. And um, my, one of my other earlier books, which was called Death Summer Coat, and I've just reprised um, a kind of post-COVID version of this in an article series for Elemental called Coping with Death, I specifically have one called death is a process um, and life is a process. And we don't like that. We, we much prefer this nice categories where we can go, this goes here and that goes there, which is probably also why we have so many people uh, against you know, trans identity and, and sexual fluidity and gender fluidity. Um, but in reality, everything is actually fluid, including our consciousness. So are you familiar with the term panpsychism? Um, I've heard it. I wouldn't call myself familiar. <laughs> so I've had a, a couple folks on the show who've talked about it in one way or another before. It's the idea that consciousness resides in everything. So the oh, smallest mm -hmm. grain of matter has some atom, so to speak, of consciousness. And then, of course, human beings have a much richer and complex one. But that what I like about it is that it doesn't require magical thinking in the sense that there is no one moment when you go from completely inert matter that has no conscious existence to, you know, to, to human beings. And there, there is no moment in the theory of, you know, in the panpsychist view, there is no one magic moment where, you know, where you go from completely inert to self-conscious, right. right? It is all gradations. It mm -hmm. is all marginality. And you can probably also look at it as multifaceted and different kinds yeah. of consciousness. And as you bundle up different, it's also interwoven with the idea that we don't have one consciousness, that right. this is an artifact and it appears to us that way, but that our bellies they may not have self-consciousness in the way that we imagine it, but they are doing something that is like consciousness. So you have these interwoven conscious body parts and agents at different levels. It's, it's a much more complicated and, and richer yeah. view. Well, and I think, uh, so I love the fact that you're giving me a chance to talk about all my books uh, on here. So <laughs> I also wrote a book called Clockwork Futures, which is about, it's, it's largely, um, humans manipulating power, basically, our, our ability to create, manufacture power. But one of the things I talk about is AI uh, in, that, in that book and about how we, we ask ourselves questions like, well, how close is artificial intelligence to quote unquote real intelligence? So, and um, I was interviewing, there's a Japanese robotics manufacturer and he says, you know, in Japan, we think everything has a soul. So therefore, you know, this rock and my chair and that table over there. And so, yes, this this robot version of myself, which he built, um, is is still me. It's just as much me as as I am sitting over here. And I remember being really blown away by that and got to got myself to thinking, well, gosh, now we have uh, developed ways of putting implants in our brains that allow us to control, say, a prosthetic arm. But that means that you're translating brain waves to ones and zeros to computer code. So maybe the real answer is 
maybe all intelligence is artificial or none of it is. So it's it's a fascinating way of, of kind well, of- Well, if, we, if we live in a simulation, then we are an artificial well, intelligence. <laughs> that's that's true. You know, the matrix is coming out again, I think I heard. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's fascinating. Now, on the flip side, one of the things I discovered, uh, I, I love the sort of philosophical querying of this, but of course, as I'm researching in this book, um, it has, the problems are the practical realities, which is who gets to decide when you're alive enough not to kill you? Um, you know, who gets to decide when you're dead enough to take your organs? And it becomes a really charged issue during the civil rights movement, partly because uh, I mentioned Christian Barnard, his first, his second heart transplant, he took the heart of a black man and put it inside of a white man in the middle of apartheid South Africa. And there was some discussion with the original doctor about whether or not the doctor thought this man was actually dead enough for the heart to be taken. And so many people feared that black bodies would be harvested to keep white bodies alive. So you, you, we have the sort of gradations and this concept of, you know, of, of you know, pan consciousness, but when it comes to the actual laws of the land, we have to watch because minorities are always the ones who fall victim you know, the social justice impetus, you know, it's not on their side. And so um, we can have wonderful philosophical conversations, but we definitely need to decide who, who we're putting in charge of making those determinations when it comes to handling a scalpel. Do you believe in the soul? Do I? Um, I do. I don't know that I believe in it in the way that White White was uh, was was Catholic. He had he had ten children, so he was very Catholic. Um, ended up being friends with two popes, including Pope John Paul II. So his conception of soul was very specifically Catholic and Christian, and informed by that dogma. Um, so much so that he didn't believe animals had souls. He only believed humans did, and he felt that animals had something more akin to sort of an animating principle or animating spirit. And he actually goes to some length describing this um, in some of his later work. But as for me, I, I do think there's something that makes us ourselves exactly what it is or, or where it lives, you know, presumably in the brain, but maybe not, maybe in the composite of brain and body that, that we are as people. Um, something certainly makes me me instead of someone else exactly where it is and, and what it is, I, I don't feel like I have, you know, this seems above my pay grade to describe. <laughs> and I, actually on that same front and on the front of marginality, I guess you inevitably get into questions of the, I guess the Theseus's ship as right. far as the human body goes, right? Mm -hmm. How many, how many parts can you replace and still be you, yeah. right? And I don't know that actually I'd, Maybe maybe you have some thoughts on the answer to that, but I actually don't think there is an answer to that mm -hmm. question. I think it probably depends on who you are. Um, one of the things that someone asked White, uh, well, what if you took a head of a man and you gave it a body transplant of a woman? Would, would they still be the same person? Mm -hmm. And White managed to talk a lot without answering it at all. So I didn't <laughs> have an answer from him. He was very slippery that way. Um, but I got to thinking about that because, of course, um, you talk about people who are who consider themselves to be in in the trans community, and they say, you know, look, I don't feel right. Literally, they suffer illness from being in the wrong to them the wrong body, feeling like they have been assigned a specific, you know, gender at birth that doesn't feel right to them. And I think, in that sense, you know, they might have a lot to say about whether or not that would matter if you got put. You know, maybe it would be far more disruptive than we like to think. Um, but then again, there might be people for whom it didn't seem to matter. I think that we're all such individual people that, you know, would it matter to, uh, would it matter to Craig Vitovitz if he was on some other body? He's not going to control the body anyway. He doesn't control his own body. He was paralyzed. Would he think it mattered? Would it matter if we actually were able to use and feel that body? It might matter a lot more. So, you know, I think that, um, it's a little bit reductive to, to say that we're, that all of us lives up in our head. I don't think that we can say that. No, not certain, not at all. Yeah. I, I think actually the only certain thing we'd, we'd know for sure if we did succeed or have succeeded in doing a, a head transplant is that the personality of that person is almost certainly going to change. Oh, that yes. so much of who we are is driven by mm -hmm. not just what's up here, but you know, but what's in the rest of us from the gut. Absolutely. To, um, uh, I remember that there was a, um, an interview with a, a child who had sickle cell 
disease and they were talking to him about, well, won't it be great when one day we have these genetic cures and, and you could be cured? And he said, but then would I be me? He was 11. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if an 11 year old can grasp the concept that we are a sum total of our bodies, our hormones, our diseases, our health, our societies, our experiences, then, you know, the fact that White found it easy to simply reduce that is, um, it's a bit hubristic, but I should, you know, hubris was part of what he did. Um, he White was playing cases. God, right? <laughs> yeah, for God. He felt he was for playing God, God for yeah. God, you know, um, and he he did say things like that. He, he very much, uh, I, let me put it this way, the title of the book, Mr. Humble and Dr. Butcher, those were two nicknames that belonged to Dr. White. I didn't invent those. Dr. Butcher is what he was called by people with PETA and other animal rights groups. And he called himself Mr. Humble. And I think that says a lot. <laughs> if you feel that you can call yourself Mr. Humble, probably you're not that. <laughs> so um, he had a big personality and uh, he's someone for whom he thought Victor Frankenstein was not a cautionary tale. So you have to you know, look at that in context. He felt that he was right. And I'm not sure that he ever ever strayed from thinking that he was right about what he was doing and and the fact that he really felt that it was a god-directed mission on the the flip side of that um the you know the young child who says will i still be me mm -hmm. is that one of the things that maybe makes us unique as human beings is intentionality mm -hmm. and so if our personality has changed because we've changed something about our body but at the same time we wanted that right. part of our personality to change well it's a little bit different than yeah. having a change forced on us but then i guess on the other hand you know i don't think that someone who's lost a leg is no longer still them even if it was accidental that they lost that leg so it's complicated it is complicated. I, you know, so um, as I said, I've done a lot with death studies and uh, that was my first book and many of my articles uh, about that. We're not even the same person after we lose someone. You know, um, if you mm. lose someone that, that you're a child, a parent, a loved one, a, a spouse, a, an animal, you're not the same person the next day. And it might be like an amputation. You've actually lost bits of yourself. And um, I have a friend who believes, I love this concept. I don't know that I believe it scientifically, but I like the idea that uh, if you live with someone long enough, you're probably sharing electrons. And so you do lose a bit of yourself when they're gone. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a nice idea. Uh, and, I, I, and also a sort of scary one that we are so much a part of the people that surround us that um, I think our minds ourselves don't inhabit only our bodies. And so I guess that gets back to your point about the panpsychical mm -hmm. idea. Um, you know, I'm not gonna be my, the same person I am today tomorrow. Uh, I'm not gonna be the same person I am today six months from now so uh, you know i think it's interesting that white was so he had rhetorical reasons for doing it though of course if you want somebody to agree that they're going to let you take someone's head and put it on someone else's body you you sort of have to convince them that you're absolutely 100 sure that they'll be the same on the other side one of the one of the interesting things about the when you begin to go down these rabbit holes and certainly in the book you see this is that as you get to those liminal spaces you end up you start with science and you inevitably end up with philosophy and religious oh, yeah. tradition, tradition. And it may be that that is actually at some point, the only way you can sort these things out is that there isn't, uh, there may ultimately not be a scientific answer to right. these kind of questions. And maybe there shouldn't be, you know, um, the trick is we don't want to abdicate the responsibility for the decisions to science only. Um, I, I believe in science. Uh, I think the COVID pandemic has taught me even more <laughs> than I ever did before just how important science is and that we should follow the science. But as everyday people, we need to know and care about how we arrive at things. You know, we can't, I actually, I, uh, the book was very well received and very well reviewed in most places, including the New York Times. But I had a review in The Spectator in the UK where the, uh, the reader said, um, I hated reading this book. This is terrible. I don't want to know how we got to these breakthroughs. And I thought, that's where, that's where we're wrong. We, we need to want to know how we get our science. So that, you know, because technology, sometimes we can't predict the consequences of, of where it will go. And you don't want to abdicate the responsibility for that only to, to other people. You want everyone to kind of have input on that, including uh, the people who will be most vulnerable to it. Yeah, interesting. I, I 
took away the exact opposite impression of the science through the the pandemic it seemed like a complete breakdown and failure of the the i guess i'd call it the the establishment um scientific apparatus that we have and the way in which it locked uh shields around uh certain ideas that were outside of what the narrative that it wanted to push everything from the lab leak, right. uh, hypothesis which was completely verboten until it wasn't right. um and, and so forth so i very much agree that we do need to be aware of what's happening in the scientific realm but also very very aware of the limitations of institutional science and the ways in which science has been very very wrong in the past and there's well, no reason to think it won't be what we're you know what we're doing today mm -hmm. won't be overturned right I, I actually think our two our two perspectives kind of agree uh, in the sense that the science itself is inert um it, it's it's systems that become problematic um, the politicization mm. of science, uh, mm -hmm. the way that it's used by people to achieve certain ends. And so um, I have never had my belief in science shaken, but in scientific communicators and in scientific institutions and medical institutions, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely skeptical lots of times of that. But that's because, again, somewhere along the way, we as, as individual people decided like that spectator reader, right, to only focus on what we got out of it, not to look at the ways in which we got it. Um, and so I had somebody ask me like, why are you wanting to tell us this terrible story of, of all this animal experimentation? And I mm -hmm. said, because you need to know about it because this is a story about the rhetorical uses of science, the political uses of science, the, the reason that it was funded at all was because we were trying to get back at the Russians. I mean, think about that. I believe in science, mm -hmm. um, but who's using it and who's, who's been given the rights to decide what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Uh, because we get to the cans long before we get to the shoulds usually in science. And so, you know, who do we want to put in charge of, mm -hmm. of that over us? Shouldn't, shouldn't we want to be, you know, involved, invested and in reading about the, the ways as well as, you know, the, the means and the ways. Yeah, I, that I agree with completely. Yeah. I think that's a, a great place to leave it. Thank you so much for coming on. Where uh, where can where's the best place for people to visit to find out more about your work? Ah, oh, well, I'm everywhere. Uh, this is the best part about. Um, I have a really unusual name because my first name is based on alcohol. Uh, <laughs> it's Brandy, and my last name is Skilache, which is spelled strange. It's S C H I L L A C E, and there's no Brandy Skilaches anywhere else except for me. <laughs> so I'm easy to find. But uh, if you go to my website, brandyskilache.com, you can see my books there. If you're interested in joining, say, a peculiar book club where we look at these very sorts of things um, with the authors, uh, you can get to that on my site as well. And that we have a live stream and a YouTube channel. Um, and I'm on Twitter. I almost live there. Uh, and it's at B Skilache. So I hope you guys will come. My book's available everywhere. Um, go to your favorite local because I, I love to support local books and if you want a signed copy I do those too through Max Bax in Cleveland so um, really really happy to be part of the show and to share with you all this wonderful stuff you have such great perspective on the sort of philosophical liminal spaces well thank you so much for coming on your book is right up my alley and it was <laughs> extraordinarily well done so I compliment you on it thank you so much